Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we'll kick off because there is a lot to get through this afternoon, so um, we're going to speed through a little bit. But um, thank you all very, very much for being here. Um, and also th warm thanks to the panel for uh, joining us. Um, I'm Rachel Browning. I'm Acting Head of Programmes at Art Fund. And I am joined here today by Caitlin Griffiths from Museum Consultancy, um, Hedley Swain from Arts Council England, and Catherine Newley from St Albans Museums. Um, so, as I said, there's lots to get through, so bear with us. Um, what we're here to do is talk about a report that we have just launched today, um, which looks into the sort of state of, of play, state of the nation in terms of 21st century curatorships. Um, as many of you, many of you will know about this because you've generously contributed to the research that we've been doing over the last 18 months, so thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I'm delighted to say that we have now published the report, it's available on our website, so um, if you haven't already, please do go and read it and download it. It's at www.artfund.org forward slash 21cc. Um, it's kind of been, it's been titled, imaginatively, um, the uh, 21st Century Curator, a report into the evolving role of the UK museum curator and their needs for the future. Um, it's worth noting that it's not an exhaustive document. Um, it could have been much, much, much longer. We did a lot of research, but we tried to sort of cram it into as concise a volume as possible. It's not 110 pages, don't worry. Um, but what it really tries to do is provide a snapshot of the recent and current picture of curatorship and map out some practical recommendations for the sector. Um, it's worth also mentioning that it's a working document, um, so it may well be updated and resolved as we work through the issues that are raised within it. Um, so the session today is intended to launch the report, share and um, explore some of the key findings, and also look at ways in which together we can better equip curators with the tools, skills and agency that they need to continue to fulfil their roles so brilliantly. So the plan for the next less than an hour now is to split it into sort of four sections. So um, first what we'll have is uh, we'll hear from Caitlin who did all the hard work and actually did the research and she will talk us through some of the key findings. Um, then we'll have a short panel discussion um, where we will look into some of the, the findings that were um, highlighted and then it's over to you, um, the delegates um, here today, to split into groups, um, which is where your worksheets come in, and uh, test and discuss the findings. Um, but before we kick off the sort of uh, formal business, so to say, I'd like to um, allow the panel to actually introduce themselves um, and maybe say in a sentence or two um, why they feel, um, if they do feel, that the topic that we're discussing today is important and uh, urgent. So I'll start here. Okay, so yeah, I'm Catherine. I'm from St Albans Museums. I was a participant in the report. Um, I was interviewed as part of that. Um, I'm a social history historian who's been a curator in local authority museums, um, often where there's not many curators uh, specialising in particular subjects. So it's, uh, I'm very much class myself as a generalist. So I think it's quite interesting to see what's come out of this report. Thank you. Hadley? So, hello. Uh, some of you will know me very well and some of you won't know me at all. Um, I am currently Director of Museums at Arts Council, um, but then before that I was, uh, or am, the Area Director Arts Council South East, but before that I was the Director of Museums at Arts Council, before that I was Head of Policy at Museums at MLA, and before that I was a, I was a curator. Uh, I was uh, a curator at the Museum of London, and before that I was an archaeologist. So this is very dear to me, because although I absolutely love my job now, if I think about my career, that period at the Museum of London um, was particularly special to me. And that role of being at the heart of understanding collections, but making them relevant and communicating them, for me, is absolutely what is at the centre of museums and being a museum person. So I think this is incredibly relevant and important. Thank you. I'm Caitlin Griffiths from the Museum Consultancy, and I guess I'm here to because we were the ones that undertook the, the research. But for me, um, the reason we wanted to work with the Art Fund and actually undertake the, the research is, I think, similar to Headley, just thinking about all the work that people have been talking about over the last couple of days within yeah. museums. The core of all of that starts with the collection. 
and it seems it's essential to have people who have the skills and the knowledge to be able to care for, to develop and to kind of share those collections. And I guess we wanted just to check on the state of how that was in museums across the UK and if there were any room for improvement or need for changes. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, Caitlin, without further ado, do you want to um, go and uh, speak to some of uh, these findings? Um, I'd also like to say that we've given Caitlin the very, very unfair task of having to whip through these in eight minutes, which is, which is cruel and unusual. Um, but, yes, this, um, well, I'll, over to you. Thank you, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, and I really welcome the chance to share some of the findings from the research that the museum consultancy undertook for the Art Fund in 2016, which has formed, um, which has informed the report that's come out today. So the aim of the research was really to develop a better understanding of how the role of the curator has been changing over the last 15 to 16 years. Um, to see how curatorial work has been affected by the big changes of this period. So a period of both significant investment and cuts, fast-paced changes in technology that have altered how we interact, and demographic and societal changes. We also wanted to understand what the role of the cu curator might be in the future. I'm really pleased to say that the approach that we've ended up taking has been a consultative one. I have to say initially it was based mainly on desk research, and then we undertook a set of kind of 20 to 25 interviews, and we came up with a set of findings, but we really didn't feel confident that with the number of people we talked to, we could, um, we could talk confidently about the state of curatorship. So we did a, a large online survey, and as a result of that and the phone interviews, over 550 people have contributed their views, to, um, their views and their experience to this piece of research. Um, as I said, we focused particularly on 2000 to um, 2015. Um, so it's probably fair to say that the research produced a, a pretty mixed and at times contradictory picture. Encouragingly, um, it highlighted a lot of positive changes and innovations, but at the same time, there is a lot of anxiety out there. Um, and concern about how this area of practice might be changing. Interestingly, people's views were often coloured by the type of museum they worked in or perhaps the stage in their careers that they were at. So let's start with on the positive side. Um, curators really feel that their work is more innovative now. So over 60% of respondents said that curatorial work is more innovative than it was 10 years ago. In particular, increased collaboration with audiences and finding ways to involve the public in shaping narratives and content has increased this sense of innovation. Digital technologies have transformed relationships, in particular the, di the dynamic between the curator um, and the visitor. The speed and ease in which a curator can communicate both with the public and with the colleagues has been transformative, and this is really improving collections, access to collections. There's a strong sense of community. There's a lot of collaboration going on across organisations and the sector. There's a much more integrated approach with people working across disciplinary teams. And I'm sure it won't be a surprise to you to hear, but curators are great at sharing. Um, really encouragingly, people don't seem to find it hard to seek out knowledge and skills. And 85% of respondents said they look to friends and colleagues when they need information and advice. And only 14% said that they find it hard to source external expertise. Curators feel empowered to take risks. So when we ask people if they feel able to take risks around the content or subject matter of exhibitions, the majority of people said they do feel empowered, with 22% saying they actually um, positively encouraged to do so. Only 20% of people felt that they were discouraged or prevented from taking risks. And lastly, the curator's day is now more varied. So we found that curators are still spending the majority of their time on curatorial tasks, so collections development, care, research. But this work is now increasingly driven by exhibition programmes and other public-facing projects rather than on day-to-day -day care of collections. 
So 44% of people who responded to the survey said they spend between 25% and 50% of their time working on ex exhibition-related work. Um, and 45% identified exhibition development as being the biggest driver for their work. Lastly, on the positive front, over 76% of people felt that they have the knowledge in-house to work with the majority of their collections. Um, but as we said, it was a mixed picture. And alongside the positive developments, there is a sense of concern and anxiety um, about the current state of curatorial work and, the and what the future might hold. So over 45% of respondents feel negative about the current state of museum curatorship compared with just 24 who feel positive. And through the research, they highlighted a number of areas that seem to be causing them anxiety or concern. So the first is that the number of curatorial posts is decreasing. So both our anecdotal evidence and the data analysis show that this is the case. So over 70% of respondents reported that curatorial resources in their museum or gallery had been reduced in the last 10 years. And as part of the research, we um, tracked the increases and decreases in curatorial posts at seven museums during 2000 and 2010. And despite the fact that this was a period of growth for many museums until the financial crash at the end of the decade, only two museums saw a significant growth in curators employed there, and in this period, sorry, employed in this period, and decline has now occurred in, in the majority of those museums. Um, there is a lot of anxiety about the decline in specialist knowledge. Poor succession planning, short-term contracts, and redundancies leading to loss of posts are all contributing to this sense of concern. So 62% of respondents feel that curatorial skills and knowledge are being lost within their organisation, and concern seems to be particularly high amongst those working in local authorities. Interestingly, um, that's slightly at odds with the previous finding, that 76% of people feel they have the knowledge in-house to work with their collection, so maybe something to unpick there. Um, a number of people see national museums and universities as being key sources of collections expertise in the future. The number of generalist curators is on the rise. Curators are increasingly required to be responsible for numerous collections, to have a general understanding of a wide range of collections rather than a deep knowledge of just one or two. So this area was, was one that really seemed to split people many seeing it as just another indication of the erosion or hollowing out of specialist knowledge and skills, whilst others were much more relaxed about it and saw it as a natural evolution. The issue here is really to ensure that generalist curators can be supported to get the knowledge they need for the collections they manage. Um, curators' responsibilities are being extended. What came across strongly in the research was that, like all areas, um, of museums, curators feel like they're being asked to do more with less, less staff, smaller budgets, um, just less resources. So one interviewee spoke about staff being stretched to breaking point. But people also highlighted the fact that they are also, people, sorry, people also highlighted the fact that they are now being asked to work much more commercially, in much more commercially minded ways, to contribute to fundraising and to income generating activities. Interesting though, 90% of respondents feel that actually they should be contributing to this areas, to these areas. Um, but actually 80% of people say that they spend less than 15% of their time working on this type of activity, and 40% of people identified income-generating activities as being the least important driver for their work. Um, and lastly, curators feel that their work isn't well understood. So 44% of people feel like work is not well their work is not well understood within their own organisation, and 77% of people feel their work is not well understood outside of the sector. And certainly in the local authority context, 
Um, this is leading to people feeling anxious about job losses and their jobs being identified. So, given all of this, um, we try to look at um, what are the skills and behaviours that curators uh, might need in the future. So, storytelling and being a facilitator for sharing knowledge is seen as very important. And in addition to core, to core curatorial skills, communication and project management um, were seen as essential. An ability to work collaboratively, to be flexible, and, to, and able to function in changing environments, and an openness to new ideas and points of view, were all seen as important attitudes and behaviours to have in the future. So what next? Um, I think, as Rachel said, this is a working document, and so we begin to set out some of the, the recommendations, and I think we're interested to get your views today, but also the Art Fund's interested to get your views um, on a wider kind of scale. So they've identified um, a number of, a number of um, recommendations. Firstly, given the anxiety people have about a lack of understanding of their work, curators really need champions. Um, they need to be able to make the case for their work, but they also need um, cultural leaders and funders to advocate for the work that they do. Um, curators, given the importance of storytelling and communication, we need to ensure that curators are given, are supported to gain the skills and experience in these areas and in the other, the other skills that they will need in the future. Um, support networks are essential for continuing to develop and share curatorial knowledge and skills. Networks are clearly valued. So 85% of respondents saw networks as being um, important to them. So the question is, what is the role then for SSNs? Um, and is there a role for increased investment um, in them in the future? Also, museums and their supporters need to find ways to ensure that knowledge is not lost. And lastly, um, we need to think about what role the national museums might be encouraged to play to support um, the development of curatorial knowledge and skills beyond their own institutions. So that's a summary of the, of the research. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, as I said, very much whistle stop, but um, there is more detail in the full document. Um, so I'm gonna, now going to um, kind of turn to the panel and ask them to um, contribute um, some of their views. Um, I'll kick off with a question. Um, so thinking about this topic of curatorial provision and support against what we know and what we've heard over the last two days is an is a evolving and sometimes challenging uh, financial backdrop. How do you think today's curators can be practically supported to both um, evolve and thrive in their roles? And maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Catherine, to kick that off. I'm going to start with an unashamed plug for subject <laughs> specialist networks. So, um, yeah, in the house. Woo. Um, I, until recently, was chair of the Social History Curators Group, and that's one of over 40 subject specialist networks um, that work, operate across uh, the UK and sometimes beyond. Um, and I just can't under undersell how much they can support curators, especially those that are, like me, in a bit of a generalist position. Um, there's a mix of models. Some are supported, financially supported by the Arts Council. Some are um, membership organisations and get all their fees from the members supporting them. Um, some are sort of start-ups. Um, I was speaking to someone yesterday who may be in the audience who's hoping to start an arts and crafts subject specialist network. You know, uh, there's a real range there. And, but the key thing, really, the thing that you, it links them all is this idea of um, knowledge transfer of the interplay between new and emerging curators who may be feeling a little bit daunted about you know, suddenly having to look after a collection that they have never had to spend any time studying, um, and the established professionals who've had an entire lifetime of, of studying a particular subject and, and relish the opportunity to give that information back and kind of share it. Um, and then there's another aspect, which is about being inspiring. So. Um, most of the networks run events for their members, they um, uh, do conferences, training days, all of which can prove enormously inspiring in terms of giving you ideas about how best to you know, put forward your plans, maybe you've got ideas of what you want to do with your collections, 
um, and also challenge as well. I know that in the social history curators group, we've um, talked a lot about this idea of specialist versus generalist and, and actually how we can incorporate some of our social history practices with other disciplines. So we've done a lot of joint working with other subject specialist networks to bring a social history perspective to um, geology, for instance, or um, uh, collaborate on uh, photographic material or uh, medals and money, for instance. So there's plenty of kind of really good reasons why subject specialist networks can be a great support for curators. And, and kind of another key thing is just that support network, the chance to go and kind of ther group therapy um, and kind of talk through any issues that you might have in terms of, um, uh, yeah, kind of getting ideas from others. But what I would say is that subject specialist networks are predominantly are run by volunteers, curators mm -hmm. themselves, who are working full-time jobs as curators in museums and also then helping, um, helping out, you know, getting involved in other stuff. So there's, there's a, definitely a role for funders to play in kind of helping to support mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Well, turning to a funder here, do you want to build on that, Headley? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, firstly, I, I'm really chuffed because I think I created SSNs back, back, <laughs> back in the day, or at least I was the first person um, who kind of uh, provided funding. And I am a huge believer in them, and I am still a member of the Society of Museum Archaeologists, though I think my subs are due, so I hope <laughs> the treasurer is not in the audience. <laughs> um, and um, to, to, to go back a step, um, I, I, to, give, to, to give an Arts Council view, I mean, firstly... Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, the Arts Fund. This, this is an incredibly timely report, and we look forward to you know, using it in the conversations about the del delivery of the Mendoza review that you would have talked about and read in the last few days. That talks about networks, and the Arts Council is committed to continuing to support subject specialist networks. We just need to work out the, the exact mechanism in the next couple of months, but that commitment is there. However, we will expect to do that alongside the national museums who are continuing to play mm -hmm. a part, and indeed our, without getting all technical, our band three uh, museum national portfolio organisations and our, subject, uh, our support organisation, NPOs. But together, and indeed with all the other museum NPOs, uh, we are committed to subject specialist networks and we will continue to support them, and I'm sure they will mm -hmm. uh, continue to thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So... Um, Kind of moving on to sort of, uh, sort of opportunities, I suppose, that we, we've kind of we've identified to, through the report. It might be good to spend a few minutes just discussing how the changing landscape is opening up new avenues of opportunity for, for curators. So um, be they around sort of digital skills, um, around um, innovation, around um, collaboration. Um, I don't know, Caitlin, if you want to just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's been one of the most encouraging things about the research is just actually the different ways that people are using their collections to engage with people. And actually, I thought this morning, listening to the two um, keynotes at the first, to uh, so Jeremy Della, that, that, that project, that fantastic kind of way of actually starting with the core, which is, inf you know, museum information, collection information, and then actually how can you take that out and then becoming this fantastic artistic kind of project and actually reaching out to people. But at its core, there was a bit where, where the soldiers would hand over um, a little card with information about the soldiers that they were representing. I thought it was a lovely way of just sort of showing how you could, how you could sort of take that, that information and take it outside of, outside of the... Um, four walls of the museum. So I think really thinking beyond the traditional exhibition space <coughs> is a real way that you can kind of um, change the way people interact with collections. And also just thinking about the other speaker, obviously talking about that very difficult kind of subject matter and creating a, a museum about the disappeared in Argentina, but really absolutely basing that on oral histories on people's experiences and I think that kind of putting the public in the driving seat and allowing them to shape it that's the fantastic opportunities that curators have now if they're kind of brave enough or willing enough to, to um, open up and admit that actually they have certain narratives but actually people can bring a lot of new and interesting points of view to objects to stories I think openness for me is, is the key to all of this. You know, if you want to be innovative, you've got to be open, open to change and not be too anxious. I know it's, there's a terrible fear of 
letting your collections go and, and, and giving people kind of access to it. But I think having a bit of, a bit of bravery. Um, just uh, Catherine and I were speaking just before everyone arrived, actually, because um, Catherine's involved in a new museum opening in St Albans, and we were talking about how you're approaching your kind of your collections and what your take is, is there. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, just that we're trying a different approach in that we're not going to be displaying lots of stuff permanently, but actually the majority, almost all of our displays are going to change and evolve. Um, and, you know, that's, that's great. It's really good because we can get more of our collections out. It will also have some challenges in terms of how do we resource all that continuous change with this very small museum team. So I think we'll be looking more and more at how we can work in co-production and kind of um, bring people in to help us do that. Um, yeah, just because, you know, there are people out there. They may not be traditional experts in terms of being curators, but they've got a lot of things to offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I'm now going to throw it over to you guys because um, I'm keen to get through um, everything that we have planned today. So, um, so yeah, we'd very much like to hear from you. So how we're, how we're going to, to do that is you've all been um, given worksheets um, and um, what we'd like to do is to have you sort of split into um, small groups of two or three um, and spend five minutes, we really don't have very long, just sort of thinking about some of the questions posed in those worksheets, reflecting on what you've heard already, reflecting on perhaps what you haven't heard. Um, and, and at the end of that five minutes, we're going to ask two or three uh, willing volunteers, uh, hopefully, to come and feedback their thoughts to the, to the broader group. Um, and at the end of the session, we're going to be collecting all the worksheets and uh, collating that information and feeding it into, um, into our report. And uh, it will kind of inform our next steps. So yeah, we're going to hand it over to you for five minutes and we'll, we'll hear from you after that. Thank you. Okay, guys, right, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up. Sorry, it sounds like you're all having really, really, really good conversations, which is fantastic. I would like to invite a couple of people down to, uh, to uh, these mics here, maybe one each, um, just to um, maybe kind of uh, feedback what you've been discussing um, and sort of let us uh, know what the responses that you've been generating are. So can we have two, two people who are willing back to feedback the thoughts of their group? Can you come down to the mic here? Sorry, just so everyone can hear you. And there's another, there's another one on that side there. Someone from oh, there's one. At the oh, there's one up there as well at the back. My group was actually slightly disappointed not to see in the report any discussion of pay, mm -hmm. because I think we all feel that pay is one of the biggest challenges to the sector, and the extraordinarily low salaries for curatorship and the decline in curatorial salaries is having a terrible knock-on effect in limiting the opportunities for people to come into the sector mm -hmm. um, from diverse backgrounds. So what that's resulting in is that to become a curator, you're expected to do unpaid internships or to volunteer or to do other unpaid work in the sector to show your commitment. And that, I think, really limits the stories we can tell and the opportunities that we have to bring more diverse voices into our collections. Co-production and co-curation is important and it has its place, but at the same time, we need to be diversifying our own workforce. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't disagree, and I don't think anyone yeah. here would. Um, as I'm sure you all know, the MA has just published its uh, salary guidelines, and yeah, and it has been borne out that uh, curators or the sort of museum professionals are paid 7% less than the market average for the roles that they fulfil. Um, I think what we can do now is use those, that, those findings and, and mark them against our research. So it's, it's also about bringing together all the research that's been done in the sector at the moment and, and using it to inform um, a wider body of work. Um, does anyone want to add anything to that comment? Uh, no, just, uh, just to kind of say that I think when we did the research, we were very aware that the MA was doing um, a quite detailed um, research into pay. And I think we rightly or wrongly thought that actually given, I guess, given the kind of amount of time we had, it wasn't an area that we could go into comprehensively. Because my experience of, you know, years ago working at the MA and doing pay, just to do that kind of research itself is massively comprehensive. So what we could have ended up with is, is just, um, I'm sure anecdotally we could have reflected the, the, the pay levels, but what we were trying to do is to try and get some kind of hard data to back it up. But I think, as, as Rachel said, now we can actually use the MA's research to support that. Great. Does anyone else want to feed back uh, what they've been discussing in their small groups? 
Anyone? Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. um, how you identified the curators. So we were talking about the diversification of job titles. So that's in my title, but there are people who are fulfilling curatorial roles or um, you may not have that in those job titles. Mm -hmm. A few things. So we tried to get a range of a range of collection specialism. So it wasn't just kind of fine art. We tried to get people working in a range of different museums, and we tried to get people working at different stages of their um, of their career. We also got a number of um, museum directors as well to get that more strategic overview and um, we spoke to um, people from Arts Council. We did interview people who had collections officer, it wasn't all kind of curatorial in, within their title but I'm sure it's a kind of shorthand, um, I'm just, oh, that's a really good point. I, I'm sure the majority probably did have curator in their title, um, so yeah, no, I think that's a, a fair point. And with the, um, the wider research that we, that we did so that when we talk about the 550 respondents, that that was targeted at either curators or people whose roles involved um, working with curators in some way. So that was that was sort of less uh, less specific in terms of in terms of people that we involved in that in that element of the research. Any other questions or comments? My thought was, oh, sorry, I'm very loud. I probably don't need the microphone. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, and my, my first thought was when I saw that was th there's this sense that being a curator is like this sacred cow that we must protect. Now, I fundamentally believe that curatorship is an important thing that, uh, that, it, that brings real value to the organisation and the sector and everything. But there wasn't a question in there that said, do we need curators anymore? <laughs> so being mm -hmm. provocative in mm -hmm. this digital world of online mm -hmm. databases and Wikipedia and Google and that, is there a point when we don't need curators? And what we should be asking curators and museums to do is to justify why we do need them mm -hmm. as to sort of baseline it. Mm -hmm. And then in that case, it's not so much about, uh, then you've got something to advocate. This is why we need them because they bring all this that you can't get through Google mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the other uh, and the, therefore the and the spin-off from that is because then we should be asking them to demonstrate the impact of what they have so just advocating and saying I'm great what I do is great isn't enough anymore we have to be asking people to advocate and also show impact of what they do mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent point does anyone want to respond to that well, I, I, I would agree absolutely, Karen, that it's not, we, there is no point anyone saying, I'm a curator, we must have curators. What you have to go back is what we're saying earlier. What, what is the core value of museums? What do they do? They inspire, they tell stories, they, they, are, uh, they, are, they are relevant, and they are through that through their collections and their core stories. And what you need are people who understand those, those wonderful stories. I'm sure all of us in this room have known people who have been able to take a particular object and tell stories and make it inspiring and make it relevant. And that's what museums are. And you're absolutely right. That's the thing that individuals and institutions must remember that we, we must remember the importance of. Any other comments? Yes, there's one back here. There's a mic running, running around to you, but if you'd bear with us two secs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah from Watford Museum, and it's uh, carrying on from what Karen said. Hi, Karen. <laughs> so loud, all of us beds and hearts people. Um, but I think it's really important for us also to, to listen to, to what our partners and stakeholders say about curators. Because actually, it's, it's carrying on from what you say, that role of curator is really valued in communities. And, and it isn't just a case of what we say as a group. Actually, it would be really lovely to, to go out to some of the people that we work with. Um, and we've done a little bit of that, but to get more of that feedback, because people are really proud to work with a curator, and they're really proud to, to access that, they value it, they want to be part of that museum, and it's about 
not working in a different way. They really care about museums. So I, I think that's something that we've missed a trick on as well, is actually taking things broader and, and getting people to not just us saying it in the room, but getting other people to shout on our behalf. Catherine, do you want to maybe yeah, I, expand on I, that? I completely agree. Um, <laughs> that's how I'm expanding. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's something about we sometimes forget where we work and, and what we do and, and value how well we do it. And I think that's not just about knowing exactly when something was made or where it came from, but also the people skills that we have and the transferable skills that we can use to communicate those stories to other people. So, yeah, no, I think there's definitely something there about getting the feedback from our audiences so we're not just telling other people something but also finding out from them what they think of what we do and how we do it and making sure that we're feeding that in i think that's important any other yes we've got one down here thank you microphone for tall people <laughs> um i'm very ordinary um i manage a listed building i'm a financial manager i manage personnel um, I'm in charge of health and safety. Um, I oversee our digital offer. I raise money. Um, I occasionally plan exhibitions and things like that. Not very often, it has to be said. My title is Museum Curator of Bassett Law Museum, which is in Retford in North Nottinghamshire. Well <laughs> worth a visit. Um, I am hearing, again, this... the way that using the term curator in a way that I don't recognise. Mm -hmm. So when people can say, you know, let go of your collections, well, in our world, we did that a long, long time ago, and we've been getting people in uh, for a long time. And we do everything in small museums. So there is, see, I'm still getting overtones of this sort of curator sitting in an ivory tower um, surrounded by their books, you know, if only. Um, but, you know, I'm not unusual. We do everything in our museums, uh, and a lot of us, like me, do it part-time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Caitlin, I see you nodding. That's no, I was just... I, I, I totally agree with you, and I think it's one of the massive kind of challenges with these pieces of research, because, you know, the term curator is so loaded, but also it's so different, you know, a curator working in a small independent museum versus, uh, you know, someone in a curator role in a national museum, and I think... So I, I think in, in that way is one of the reasons that we've made the points quite, uh, quite general a sort of a general summary. And it was, it, you know, definitely with the research, you know, um, people's experiences and what they did on a day-to-day -day basis and what concerned them really kind of changed depending on, on where they were working. And so it has definitely been a challenge of the research and, um, you know, maybe something that we need to kind of think more, more carefully about, um, about illustrating. Um, and I, I just wants to pick up on the, your point about the, you know, the, the advocacy. And what's, you know, it's massively encouraging for me to hear that actually people are, you know, where you are, people are really responding positively and, you know, curators are getting the affirmation. I think what happens with these pieces of research is that you, could, you ask the question and you get the response, but then you don't have a chance to then ask the follow-up question. So what would be interesting to all those people who felt that their work wasn't well un understood, both in their own organisations and beyond, is to try and unpick that, you know, why, why is that? How, what sort of, what, what's happened in their experience that leads them to believe that compared to other people who really feel valued? But as I say, I guess these things are sort of iterative, but those are things I'd really, really love the chance to explore in more detail. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we were talking about earlier as well that sort of hasn't really been picked up yet is um, around the sort of subject of succession planning and how, um, you know, how... Uh, museums that have very sort of specialist collections that um, are maybe looked after by a curator who's been there or a, a museum professional who's been there for a very long time um, and what happens when those people um, leave post and aren't replaced and I don't know if we want to spend maybe a couple of minutes talking about succession planning. I, I, I know this is something that as a sector we've talked about a lot and of course the MA had the monu Monum what, the Monument, the Monument Fellowship. Fellowship where it where it had sort of, I always had this image of people like my sort of age with people sitting around our, our feet listening to our <laughs> wisdom before we died. 
Um, and and, and I, that didn't feel comfortable to me. And for God's sake, if we're organisations that can't manage that sort of thing, we don't really deserve to be here. But the idea that it is absolutely essential that we hold knowledge and we share knowledge, and that knowledge isn't held in single individuals who are allowed to take it all away is surely really important. And any, any mature organisation thinks about institutional knowledge and collective knowledge rather than individual mm -hmm. knowledge. And I, I'm sure there are pockets of the sector where there is, that is still there, and if it is still there, we need to get rid of it. We need to think about institutional shared knowledge, mm -hmm. not, not individual uh, knowledge that can go with, with, with somebody. Mm -hmm. I think the interesting thing is how do you do that? How do you make sure that that knowledge is shared? What are the mechanisms mm -hmm. through which you can do that? I mean, one of the things we've, we did with Social History Creators Group was um, we had a, a funded project from Esme Fairbairn, which was Tools for the Trade, and that was looking at agricultural tools that were no longer being used or recognised by many curators um, around the country, especially those that perhaps that, yeah, never encountered them, um, and uh, creating digital resources, things that we could use with our, um, with our members in the group uh, to train them, but also were still as accessible for anyone who had an interest and were on YouTube and freely available. So kind of that, that knowledge doesn't just have to be within curators, but you're sharing it more generally. So mechanisms like that, I think, good but I'd be interested to hear if there are others that people can suggest. Do you have any other questions for about the research or more broadly anything that people would like to just reflect on in terms of the subject? I've got another thing. Oh, oh no I've go for there, it. Yeah. <laughs> Scream. Yeah. <so. laughs> I, I am, yeah, to start again, thank you. Sorry, my name is Heather. Hello. Um, I come from Norwich. I'm somebody who has worked in a local authority museum for 25 years and has recently been, a I have become a deleted post, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, an exhibitions post that encompassed a degree of uh, curatorship through the production, the, through their research and production of exhibitions. I think it's true that curators' posts and exhibitions officer posts are quite often blurred, so that within an organisation, because there is often a very strong emphasis on curators to keep delivering high-quality exhibitions, um, my role was such that as an exhibitions officer and as a trained curator, I was fulfilling both roles, but not necessarily understood within the organisation to be supporting a lack of curatorial hours. So that, that's one point that I'd like mm -hmm, to make. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the blurring of boundaries within our profession is uh, a very problematic one. Um, I went to the Art in Society session yesterday afternoon at the, the ME conference, and it was interesting that there was a discussion around uh, learning and curatorship, and should there be some way of being able to bring together those two disciplines in a way that really understands much more fully what it means to be working in an organisation where, as a curator, you are an educator, absolutely. In whatever you do, you are researching collections, you are communicating about collections. And it's, it's, it's possible that from the public's point of view, they don't necessarily really recognise curators as, as operating in that fundamental role. Um, I think also the values of the institution. I think it's really important for me to come to the ME conference just now as somebody who is working now or, or trying to work outside of an institution, uh, recognising how welcoming, how um, diverse and inclusive this sector really is towards uh, um, society, towards the collections that we work with, uh, the museums in which we try to communicate um, histories of, of people and um, uh, all the, the, the museums that we work in with represent. So, uh, you know, there is something fundamentally about the values that we work with in museums that we need to be able to communicate through our passion, through, through our heartfelt understanding uh, of the importance and the necessity for museums and how to get that across to the public in a way that is much more direct than we are perhaps at the moment. Um, you know, we're, we're in a world now where we're kind of fighting for jobs, fighting for recognition that curators need to exist in the first place. It's terribly important that we actually understand and celebrate what curators are doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that we would be an impoverished society without them. Thank you very much. Any other comments here? Do you like to reflect on anything that's been... I mean, just to, the, the, the colleague from Nottingham, I mean, I, 
the, I, I think we are right to really um, push back against this idea that there is such a thing as a curator that needs preserving. But, but I think the idea that museums have collections and that they use those collections to inspire people and tell stories and be relevant and be relevant in society, and they can only do that if they have a true, deep understanding of those collections and know how to make them relevant. I think that's what we're talking about, and that's, that's what we lose at our peril. And I think we also forget at our peril how we are trusted in quite an old-fashioned way, to, to, to get things right. And I, I always remember there was... It's gone now, so I, I feel less worried about it. There was a major regional museum that the first object you saw was this sort of feather dress and it, or feather thing, and it said, from the Hawaii or something like that. And it absolutely wasn't. It was, a, it was from the 19th century English stately homes, and anyone who looked could see that they were grouse feathers, and it was... And it used to make me feel queasy because it was just, it was wrong. And, and however petty that is, the idea that, for God's sake, we, we must talk from authority and we must understand our collections. But once we understand them, we then have to use that to inspire and be relevant. That's, the, for me, the curatorial essence that we have, to, we have to cling on to. And I think there's something there about support from nationals as well. Mm -hmm. So that we, we haven't really touched on that today, but um, where there is that pool of, of resource and expertise that we could be drawing on nationally, literally nationally, mm -hmm. to get that information to support that so that then the people on the ground can carry on doing the kind of mm -hmm. getting it out there bit. No, I'd agree. And I think there's also, you know, the, what, the, what the research sort of um, also highlighted was there's a great deal of potential when it comes to nationals continuing to build on the fantastic work they're already doing, but also university and university collections and curators and museums. And so a, a joining up of sort of all of all institutions that are in some way um, uh, linked to sort of collections development um, exhibition making and and uh, that sort of that network becoming coalesced um, I think is something that we definitely saw and, and if I, that, that is exactly what the Mendoza report says mm -hmm. and that is exactly you know next week I, you know as you sit we begin to sit down with DCMS we sit down with the HLF and we sit down with the nationals that is that that idea that there may not be new money, but we have this incredible capacity, and what we now need to do is make sure we use that capacity for the benefit of everyone, is mm -hmm. what, we, what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, yes. Hi. Um, we were just discussing um, an idea that I've been sort of wittering about for a while. Um, I'm Caro, I'm the director of the Foundling Museum, and uh, we have a very remarkable collection, um, which, uh, and I have one curator who is part-time, and we do three major shows a year for us. Um, and our major show, our exhibition gallery, is compared to a major nationals, probably the size of a gallery gallery. Um, and I was 10 years at Tate, and I remember the frustration of my curatorial colleagues in the collections department. Um, and I'm thinking about the historic British particularly, say for our collection. And I think there would be real value, how frustrating it was for them who had ideas that they knew would never see the light of day as an exhibition mm. at Tate Britain mm. um, because they weren't, for all sorts of complex reasons, <laughs> the sort of idea that would make a major exhibition at Tate Britain, but would be a fantastic idea for an exhibition at the Foundling mm -hmm. because our collection chimes, it could work really well, and that how I think there would be real thinking about, and it's not just the Foundling, there'll be museums around the country, that that expertise, but that as well would be fantastic for those curators to be able to mount a major exhibition. You know, we have the resources, we have the budget there, we have our comm staff, we would do, and yes, it would be additional to their work, maybe they could spend some time out, be seconded, I, but there is also that, that real sense of, there are, there's knowledge that often can't find an outlet, and that the big nationals who have many more curators, who are great subject specialists, often don't have literally the venue to sometimes get their ideas out, mm -hmm. whereas you've got people like us who are struggling to do three shows a year who don't have mm. the brain. Anyway, I think there's something there about mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to swap and, and show, yeah, you've got the brain, we've got the space. And you've both got the enthusiasm. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
Fantastic. Um, I'm afraid I think that takes us pretty much to time. Um, but um, thank you all so much, and thank you for feeding back so honestly and openly on, on our report. Um, as I said, it's very much just a starting point, um, and it's now what we do with it that counts. Um, and um, I don't know if you were here this morning, but as uh, Stephen, uh, Art Fund's director, also said, um, you know, we're, Art Fund is more and more uh, becoming a organisation with its sort of ears open. Um, we are doing more and more listening, and we want to hear what is important to you and, um, and what your priorities are um, over the next 10, 20, 100 years. You know, we're, we're, we're really, really keen to kind of, to make sure that we are, uh, we are serving uh, the needs of the museums and galleries that we're so proud to work with. Um, so our plan is to collate all the feedback that you've been filling out, thank you very much, um, and we'll feed it into the research, as we said. What we're going to do also is um, publish an abstract of this session. If you want to receive that, then what I'd recommend you do, if you haven't done already, is sign up to get the Art Fund Museum Bulletin. Um, and when we have the abstract, we will uh, disseminate it via that means. So yes, yeah, so do make sure that you hand in your worksheets at the end so we can be sure to capture everyone's uh, thoughts. Um, and uh, yeah, so the full report's available at um, uh, www.artfund.org forward slash 21cc. Thank you very, very much to um, the panel today. Um, and thank you very much to everyone um, in the audience. <laughs>